So what do you need to do parks on the air, summits on the air, other on the air activities or just operating on the field? Find out next on AA3K On The Go. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been asked several times, what do you need to do parks on the air? And I've given a rundown of the kind of equipment I carry and realized, well, that's a good topic for a video here. So what do you need to create your ultimate parks on the air, summits on the air, just getting out into the outdoors and operating HF amateur radio kit? And it's going to vary for every single one of us. I'm going to give you a rundown of basically the minimums that you need to, to bring. And when I uh, operate with uh, 100 watts of power in my ICOM 7300, I bring a lot more than those minimums. Uh, many of those items don't get used, but every now and then I do need something from that kit. I'm not going to go through every single little item that I bring, but I'm going to give you enough information that you can start putting together what's going to work for you, uh, your interests, and uh, how you want to operate. If you want to do parks on the air within a few minutes of your car, if you want to hike a mile into a summit for a summits on the air, or if you just want to bring your stuff out into the backyard and operate. So without much further ado, here we go. So what are you going to need? Well, if you want to go out and operate amateur radio in the field, the first thing you're going to need is an amateur radio. Now, this is my ICOM 7300. It is a software defined radio. It is a great radio. It is a great performer. It may no longer be at the top of the list of the Sherwood performance uh, chart, but it is still a very, very good receiver with a lot of features built into it. Very uh, relatively lightweight for the field and uh, definitely can be used as a full-time at home station. Uh, I use this when I'm operating uh, only within a few minutes of my car or going on camping trips in my camper and uh, I typically operate this at 100 watts, uh, especially if I have commercial power to hook this up to through a power supply. Now this is, you know, pretty good size radio. It's probably eight, nine pounds. I'll put the exact weight on the screen. Um, and there are some larger backpacks. Gigaparts makes a very large backpack specifically for amateur radio use. And uh, there is at least one ham radio YouTuber that does take a full size Yesu radio with him uh, in his outings. But he also doesn't travel more than a few minutes from where his car is going. If you want to do summits on the air, you could definitely bring this along with a, with a 15 or 20 hour lithium iron phosphate battery and uh, you know and do a great activation uh, if you're going to be hiking a mile into the woods or a mile up a mountain carrying this much weight will definitely say hello when i am going to be traveling uh and i don't know if i'm going to be able to do amateur radio i know i'm going to be walking quite a ways i'll typically bring my qrp radio which is an yesu ft817 significantly lighter and if you watch my video as to what is packed in my qrp go bag uh, this is the star of the show there. This is only a pound or two and it's a very low current drawer so I can run with a much lighter battery for this. If I'm really going to be going up mountains or such or not sure if I'm going to be operating or traveling internationally, I have a true SDX and I've used this for two parks on the air activations very successfully. And for the very first activation that I ever did at French Creek State Park here in Pennsylvania, uh, I got a SM3 Sweden contact back, 5 watts across the Atlantic. Definitely a capable radio. The next thing you're going to need for almost all radios, the true SDX is a slight exception to this, is some sort of microphone if you're doing voice, or some sort of CW paddles or straight key if you're going to be doing Morse code. Uh, the true SDX does have a built-in microphone. I've done a quick test with uh, setting up a voice recorder at uh, my home station and transmitting on the True SDX out in the backyard. And uh, it sounded good, but I have not made any voice contacts with the True SDX yet. Uh, these paddles by CW Morse are what I use when I'm operating with the 7300. And I have smaller sets of paddles for both the True SDX and my FT817. Um, when I'm out operating in the field and just sitting at a park picnic bench or something like that, I prefer to use a single-sided headset. 
Uh, this way I can keep my other ear open to hear what's going on around me. You always have to be concerned about personal security. And it also ends up freeing up both of my hands so I can touch type uh, entering. Uh, we'll cover logging in a few moments, but I almost exclusively compute a log. So having both key hands free to type is, and I do know how to touch type, is a very good advantage for me. When I'm operating in the field and I have electricity available, particularly when camping, um, I will use this older MFJ Mighty Light power supply. It is a 25 amp switching power supply and this is old enough that it was before power poles were a thing so I added my own power pole adapted to this power supply and this works absolutely fine. It's only two or three pounds, it's not that heavy so it's pretty easy to carry. Uh, when I do not have electricity available I use this 32 amp hour life pole that I got uh, as a medical pole from a company Fortunately, local to me, but they do ship called Battery Hookup. They may still have a few in stock. I will leave a link uh, to their website so you can take a look and decide if you want to get one. BioNO, Dakota Lithium, there's a whole bunch of choices on Amazon. And, uh, and there's quite a few choices nowadays in 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate batteries. Uh, they're obviously bigger and heavier but they'll keep you going for many hours in the field. When I do QRP operations, I typically bring this MyAD 8 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery, and this keeps me going for several hours with, you know, with still plenty of capacity left in the battery. I do have the bigger brother to these, the 16 amp hours that I have used with my ICOM 7300, and I have easily gotten two or three hours out of that battery with plenty of power to spare, primarily finding that the laptop's battery is what gives out in the end. The next thing you need to consider is an antenna. Obviously, radios don't work very well without antennas, not only for receiving, but for transmitting. My preference is for resonant antennas, and I have really become a fan of NFED half-wave antennas like this 10 antennas. Uh, antenna that I built. You can buy the matching unit uh, on eBay and I'll find a link for it and include it in the description. And I have a video about how to tune one of these antennas up. I've built uh, one for myself and another for a friend. I've also recently purchased the real potable NFED half wave, which has the advantage that you can adjust the overall length of the wire and dial in its tuning uh, on any of the bands that it's resonant on. And maybe even get this thing to operate in the walk bands. Uh, both of these antennas, you know, not impossible, but a little bit on the large side to carry. When I'm doing QRP operations, I like to use the KM4 ACK and Fed Half Wave. Operates just the same as this bigger 10 antennas and Fed Half Wave. Uh, but it's in a much more compact package with uh, a lighter gauge wire uh, comes with a winder and such again I'll include a link to this. I have done so in several videos. It's a really nice antenna very easy to put together Everything you need is in one kit and the cost is extremely reasonable uh, Though I don't have it handy to show you right now I also like my center loaded ver ground mounted vertical antenna and if you watch my video about my favorite antennas for operating in the field, that and the NFED half wave are my two favorite types of antennas to use. Both of those an antennas are great antennas you and you do not need to use an antenna matching unit for any uh, band that the antenna is resonant on. And the advantage of the center loaded vertical is you can adjust it to get it resonant on any amateur radio band. And for the true SDX in the little go kit that I put together, I also have an NFED half wave antenna and that connects directly to the radio so I do not need to use any coax. To connect your antenna to your radio, you do need to ha bring along some coax. Now this is RG8X, I also have Messi and Poloni, Potaflex 7, uh, and they're both pretty big in their own right even when coiled up and weigh a pound or two to bring. Uh, I also for QRP work, this is a bit much to bring with me, but as you have watched my video on mini coax, both RG174 and 316 do have a high amount of loss, even in the HF bands. You could be losing close to 20% of your power just in the coax. And when you're only putting out maybe five watts, every watt getting out is important for getting a contact. 
So I have recently used RG8X uh, along with the 817 and the performance was a little bit better, but because the return loss was not getting swallowed up in the cable, I did notice that the KM4 ACK was reading a tiny bit higher in the SWR department. Not enough to cause a significant concern, but enough to say, hey, that coax is making a difference. In terms of putting a wire antenna up in a tree, uh, two ways you can go about it. You can use some cord and a weight on the end to throw a line over a branch and then haul up the end of the antenna to get it to hang from a tree and mount the other end somewhere convenient to your radio or within the coax reach of your radio. And if you're in a situation where you don't want to, you can't throw anything up over a tree, uh, one of these collapsible, basically fishing masts, uh, though a couple of companies, including Giga Parts, are now coming out with new versions that are much more oriented to amateur radio with stiffer tips. This is a Soda Beams Carbon 6. I've used this a couple of times. What I do is I tie the end of the antenna off to the tip of this pole, extend the whole thing, and I just go lean it into a tree branch, uh, being careful not to pull so hard on the rest of the antenna to pull the whole thing down with me. And this has worked up very well. I have had park staff look at me with this in a tree, leaning up in a tree, and they have not complained at all. And, and the next thing to talk about is logging. Personally, I prefer computer logging on either my full-size laptop or even my cell phone using hammers, or more recently, Polo Portable Logger Ham 2K. A lot of people still use, like to do pencil and paper logging, uh, such as this, or just in a notebook and such. I've done that a few times. It's, it works, it's absolutely fine. And uh, the trick though at the end is you gotta spend the time to transcribe it into your logging software and onto the Parks on the Air or Summits on the Air websites or any other such website, which when you go back and look at your handwriting, which may have been written down in the heat of battle, you say, is that a U or a V? Is that squiggle a one or a two? Where if you type it, you definitely can read what you typed every single time. For those that say, you know, heck, you know, my computer could crash and I could use the log. Yeah, that's true. You know, with the assumption that a paper log is permanent. There's a very well-known Parks on the Air operator in Florida who did an activation, stopped to get gas on the way home. While his car was filling up, decided to clean out his trunk. When he got home, he realized he threw away the logs. He ran back to the station, but they had already changed out the garbage liners and the garbage pails by the pumps, and he was not exactly about to go dumpster diving. He did apologize that he lost all of those contacts, and now turns out he computer logs because these are just as dangerous. You can pick a bad pen, these get wet, and the entire thing just runs and you can't read it anyway. So, no log is perfect. There is a risk with everything. I use a couple of different logging programs on the laptop, DX Lab Suite and 3FJP uh, and N1MM. And honestly, each one has advantages and disadvantages, I find, for Parks on the Air logging. Uh, Polo is working out very, very well. Currently, it doesn't allow me to interface to the computer, so I get automatic readout of frequency or being able to change modes. And if you're not running a resonant antenna, you will need to use a antenna matching unit of some sort. Now, this is the one from my QRP setup. It's a MTech ZMU2 ATU. And I typically use this with the speaker wire dipole that I built, which is not resonant on any particular band. You can also run this through straight coax and use this. Um, I have not uh, done so with anything other though than the speaker wire dipole. And this allows the radio to be happy, see a balanced 50 ohm load and uh, deliver its full power into the antenna. I also have an MFJ 939 automatic antenna tuner and I've typically used that with the uh, Ultimax antennas DX Dream 33 foot, which was the antenna I started out doing parks on the air with. Uh, again, that antenna is not resonant on any particular band, so you do need an, an antenna tuner or an antenna matching unit. And uh, that was particularly valued with my uh, ICOM 706 Mark II G, which does not have a built-in antenna tuner. And one of the reasons I went with the 7300 is that it has an antenna tuner built in and I did not need to carry one as a separate item. So I do, as I typically now just use resonant antennas on all of my field operations, every now and then I find you 
to my particular setup or something like that, that uh, the antenna isn't exactly behaving properly, I'll touch up the tuning through the antenna tuner built into the 7300. Uh, I can do the same in terms of using the ZM2, and I guess I'm just going to risk it with the uh, true SDX as I do not have any small antenna tuner to bring with that kit that I set up for that. If you want to run any of the digital modes, the 7300 is really handy. You just connect a USB cable to your computer and you have the sound card interface. The 7300 was designed to make that very simple. And it appears the new Yaesu FTX-1F that's coming out uh, early 2025 will have that same capability. I also know the ICOM 705, again, just needs a USB cable. But my 817 doesn't have such luck, so I use a digirig to connect it to the radio. This gives me cat control over the radio as well as the sound card interface so I can run FT8 and any other digital mode on my Yaesu FT817. The same applies to the 818 family. And the digirigs were designed to be very, very generic that they can be used across the line on many different radios and there's even a new version specifically for the Yaesu 891. So there you go, what I typically carry for my parks on the air activations. Now I do carry quite a bit more when I know I'm operating at a park at a picnic bench just a few minutes from where I've parked my car. Uh, I carry a, a voltmeter, extra rope to tie off the antenna if necessary, a couple of tools, little note, extra little notepad, sticky yellow pad and such. More than I definitely need and more than I've used, but every now and then I've had to pull out one or two of those items and make use of it, so that is particularly handy to have those stuff with me. However, if I'm going to be doing a long hike and I am planning to do a pseudo soda along with POTA at a Pennsylvania State game land that is not far from me and that has a small <laughs> small mountain, very large hill in it known as Mount Haycock. I want to go to the top of that and operate from there. Uh, in that case, I will be 99.9% .9 sure I will be bringing my Yesu FT817 backpack and everything in it uh, because it's about a mile hike from where the parking lot is to the top of that hill. As it is a state game land, I do have to be careful, especially as we're getting into uh, hunting seasons here in Pennsylvania. Now, do you need to copy exactly everything I've got here? No, you find the radio that works for you. If it's a Zygu or Yesu or, or any of the other manufacturers, especially of the QRP radios, which are becoming quite a few choices now these days, the antenna that works for you, the logging method that works for you, the antenna hanging method, the power supply, you find what works for you, and you may find yourself going through two or three options on batteries or antennas until you find out what works more conveniently for you. But that's how you set up your ultimate amateur radio field kit. So, hey, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you for watching. Remember, I'm trying to help you turn the outdoors into your ham shack. This is Mark AA3K, and I'll catch you next time on AA3K On The Go.